Hi, this is Donna Setzer from the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center. Welcome to today's webinar titled 3HP, Enough Horsepower to Drive the National TB Infection Agenda, a Critical Assessment in Conversation, co-sponsored by the Heartland and Southeastern National Tuberculosis Centers. Today's moderator is Dr. Neela Goswami. Dr. Neela Goswami is a medical officer in the Field Services Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She is an infectious diseases physician focused on TB and HIV infection and provides a clinical perspective to CDC public health policies, practices, and research programs. She provides medical and logistical support to the TB Centers of Excellence and US TB programs. Dr. Goswami, thank you for moderating this session today. And thank I now hand it Thank you, Don, and welcome to everyone for joining us today. We're hoping to have a really nice lineup of speakers for you and some conversation after. I'll be today's moderator. Welcome again to today's webinar entitled 3HP, and a, and a horsepower to drive the national TB infection agenda, a critical assessment and conversation. Um, it's sponsored by the Heartland and Southeastern National TB Centers. And today's speakers are going to be Dr. Andre Borisov, Dr. David Griffith, and Dr. David Ashkin. I'm going to start by going through some learning objectives uh, that we're going to accomplish today. So first of all, we're hoping that folks can get out of this interpreting current national TB control priorities in the context of our recent CDC recommendations for the use of 3HP to achieve optimal care for patients with latent TB infection, to list important pharmacologic aspects of rifepentine alone and in combination with INH, including toxicities to prevent primary drug resistance in patients with TB disease. We're gonna outline the evidence for the efficacy and safety of 3HP treatment of latent TB to apply in the care of patients with latent TB infection. And we're gonna investigate alternative latent TB treatment strategies for patients who are not candidates for 3HP for the purpose of improving their treatment outcomes. And I know we did a, a pre-poll before the webinar started just to see how many are familiar with 3HP. For those of you who haven't used it before, um, this acronym of 3HP just refers to three months of INH and rifepentine. So just a roadmap of where we're going today. We're gonna start with um, Dr. Borisov taking us through some background and rationale for 3HP and the treatment of LTBI. Um, he's also gonna talk us through an update of recommendations for the use of 3HP just released this year. Then we're gonna switch over to Dr. Griffith, who's gonna tell us more about rifepentine, specifically speaking to the pharmacology and using that rifepentine with our traditional isoniazid. Um, and he's also gonna go through the menu of LTBI treatment options in 2018. We're gonna round it off with Dr. Ashkin, taking us through some practical issues with 3HP and then share with you some free LTBI resources and materials that are available through CDC. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Borisov. Andre Borisov's been with CDC since 2003. Prior to joining CDC, he conducted clinical trials at the School of Medicine at Emory University. He was a member of the CDC TB Trials Consortium Prevent TB study protocol team that demonstrated safety and efficacy of three months of isoniazid and rifepentine, um, known as 3HP for the treatment of latent TB. He was also the CDC's principal investigator for the TPTC's I Adhere trial that provide additional data on safety and adherence to 3HP treatment, including taking 3HP as self-administered therapy. Dr. Borisov led CDC's 3HP guidelines work group that developed and published the CDC's updated 3HP recommendations this year. And currently Dr. Borisov is the CDC's principal investigator for the new clinical trial evaluating a novel six-week rifepentine-based regimen for LTBI treatment. So with that, Dr. Borisov, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, um, um, Nila, and uh, good afternoon to everyone um, who joined the seminar today. Um, to start, I would like to uh, start with the um, CDC expert uh, disclosure that the statement. Dr. Borisov, may we ask you to please speak up a little bit? <clears throat> yes, is thank it you. better now? It is um, better. Thank you. So, to start with the CDC disclosures, uh, that the statements in this presentation are uh, individual opinions of the presenter, uh, myself, not uh, official statements or viewer position of the CDC. And uh, please uh, visit www.cdc.gov 
for official uh, CDC recommendations and uh, documents. Also, I would like to note that um, rifapentin is uh, currently approved by the FDA for the treatment of LTBI caused by um, uh, M tuberculosis in combination with isoniazid in patients two years age and older at high risk for progression to TB. However, the label uh, indicates that the treatment should be administered as a directly absorbed therapy. So the second part of this presentation will discuss the CDC recommendation of uh, use of 3HP as self-administered uh, treatment, uh, so which would be considered off-label. But uh, uh, to be fair to uh, 3HP, it should be also noted uh, that uh, um, uh, other uh, currently used uh, regimens, uh, for example, uh, 4R, four months of uh, uh, Priftin, uh, actually the Priftin label does not have uh, LTBI as a FDA assigned indication. So it is recommended by the CDC, but uh, uh, does not have, have an official um, FDA uh, indication. Uh, in this uh, opening presentation, in this first part of the uh, webinar, um, I will provide information on the background, rationale, advantages, and overall goals of the uh, 3HP uh, regimen. Um, we will be focusing in this presentation on the uh, overall uh, U.S. public health perspective of using 3HP, not individual patient treatment perspectives, which uh, will be covered by uh, other spe speakers in this uh, webinar. So um, in this, uh, again, opening part, uh, we will provide answers to some of the questions we received uh, from you, uh, such as uh, where does LTBI therapy fit uh, in the overall scheme of the TB control in the U.S.? Uh, what is the rationale of using 3HP uh, regimen specifically for this uh, goal? Uh, why not uh, use uh, other regimen, for example? And uh, what are the advantages uh, of 3HP over uh, other alternative LTBI therapies? And uh, uh, what is our ultimate goal? What do we hope to achieve uh, by uh, using uh, 3HP. So to start the conversation, we could look at and examine the graph you can see on the top left uh, here. The graph shows the number of TB cases in the U.S. over time. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, the great progress was made in reducing the number of TB cases uh, from 1950s to the late 1980s um, in the U.S. The rapid identification and treatment of new TB cases was of paramount importance in the major effort. So the spread of TB disease was halted by stopping transmission, which resulted in drastic redu uh, reduction of the cases in the U.S. in this uh, time period. So um, actually encouraged by this trend, in 1989, the ACET, Advisory Committee for Elimination of uh, Tuberculosis recommended to the CDC to um, uh, set a specific actions with a goal uh, which would lead to elimination of tuberculosis uh, within uh, 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 one decade by uh, 2010. And just uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the reference, the elimination is defined as an incidence of less than uh, one case per one uh, million people. However, if you uh, look uh, in the graph in the period of uh, from 1985 to uh, 1982, influenced by uh, several uh, factors, primarily HIV epidemic, and uh, as a result, uh, low resources dedicated to TB, the number of reported TB cases actually increased as much as 20% uh, between this time period and this uh, reporting period. Um, from uh, 1992 forward, again, the, the tremendous efforts led to significant reduction of new TB cases 
saving human lives, reducing suffering, and saving billions of dollars. And actually, in terms of the um, <clears throat> number of cases prevented and uh, economic impact uh, it had on the uh, uh, on the uh, public health system. In later part of this graph, if you look in, from 1995 to 2014, it actually shows uh, uh, three different lines. One is the scenario one, which is on the top, shows uh, what would happen if the TB cases would uh, be static uh, in, from 1992 and forward. Uh, scenario two shows what would happen if it would be actually a uh, decline uh, in the cases, uh, for example, in foreign borns. And the last uh, line the, shows the actual TB cases. So uh, um, the analysis was conducted, which uh, showed that actually uh, during this time period, uh, from 145 to 319,000 of uh, cases of TB were prevented in this uh, time period, in this uh, 20 years time period, which actually saved uh, the U.S. public health system from uh, about three, about three to uh, 6.7 billion uh, dollars. So it's huge uh, economic uh, impact. Uh, and uh, 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 progress. Um, however, if you uh, look uh, in the recent years, uh, um, certainly tuberculosis uh, uh, has not been eliminated in the U.S. and the current incidence is uh, approximately 30 times uh, more than uh, uh, elimination uh, thresholds. So uh, if you look at the, this graph, uh, it uh, actually shows uh, that uh, in 2012, the CDC developed the mathematical transmission model of tuberculosis to actually assess a relative impact of different intervention on the time needed to achieve tuberculosis elimination in the U.S. In uh, this graph, uh, we show that uh, uh, even and uh, uh, <clears throat> So it's uh, time on the X and uh, incidence on the uh, Y axis, and uh, it shows uh, uh, three. Uh, uh, it's stratified by uh, U.S. Uh, born uh, cases in U.S. born cases in foreign born, and in the middle it's uh, uh, cases overall. So this um, uh, uh, model estimates that uh, uh, even if uh, the U.S. would achieve uh, a full cutting of transmission of TB disease, it will uh, help shortening the time to TB elimination. So if you look uh, in the middle for all and you look uh, in the solid line, the solid line shows uh, if it would be transmitted as of now, the uh, dashed line shows if the, there will be absolutely no transmission of TB, if it would be stopped, still uh, uh, the elimination would not be uh, would not be uh, achieved, neither in foreign born nor in uh, kind of in the overall uh, population. The very same model actually also looked at the impact of. Um, uh, other interventions, such as uh, impact of uh, increasing uh, LTBI treatment. So uh, here you will see uh, uh, the incidence projections assuming that the proportion of foreign-born arrivals with LTBI is reduced to 25% uh, uh, of the baseline, and this is uh, of the year 2008, and also if uh, additionally to that uh, LTBI, uh, the treatment rate of chronic LTBI is doubled or quadrupled in 2008. And as you see, uh, uh, this, um, this intervention actually has drastic effect on the reduction of uh, uh, cases and uh, bring us much closer 
to the goal of the TB elimination. So uh, stopping transmission did not, but uh, increasing the LTBI coverage uh, uh, did. So, um, so we demonstrated that cutting transmission alone is not enough. Uh, treatment of LTBI could be one of the most powerful tools uh, we can use to come closer to the ITB elimination goal. But uh, what is the rationale behind behind developing and using the 3HP regimen, uh, uh, but not, for example, uh, uh, using widely available and uh, um, uh, highly effective up to uh, 90 percent nine months of isoniazid LTBI regimen. So if you uh, look uh, on on this uh, um, uh, on this figure, which uh, use, uh, uses an example from the TB case uh, uh, contact investigation, the figure showed LTBI prevention cascade consisting of several steps. So it's uh, identifying the population at risk, testing for LTBI, evaluating those with positive TB test, initiating LTBI treatment, and finally completing uh, treatment for those who start. So um, if people fail any of uh, those steps, the effect is actual, actually um, multiplicative. Uh, so we could focus actually on the last three steps, and this is where the actual LTBI treatment uh, comes in place. So for example, let's say uh, that if uh, 93 uh, percent of contacts uh, have been identified, 82 percent of those who completed evaluation uh, uh, would have LTBI. So, and then 71 start treatment. So, and 46 of those who started actually complete treatment. Overall, you will have only about 33 percent of uh, 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 contacts of overall who actually completed treatment. So similar scenarios could be constructed for other population at high risk for developing TB, such as uh, um, previously mentioned uh, 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 newly arrived uh, LTBI uh, immigrants uh, with the uh, uh, LTBI infections. And uh, actually, unfortunately, treatment initiation and treatment completion rates uh, in this population could be even lower in those groups. So much lower than 33% uh, 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 what we um, see in uh, contacts. Um, <clears throat> so uh, data from numerous studies from programmatic experience in variety of fields, including TB, have demonstrated that shorter, simpler treatments have high acceptance and adherence by patients. Uh, therefore, we uh, have to have uh, LTBI treatments, which is short, simple, accepted by patients, uh, tolerable, uh, have uh, substantially higher treatment initiation and treatment completion rates, and uh, uh, most importantly, uh, a regimen which is uh, accepted and uh, widely used by uh, clinicians. So. Um, this is uh, uh, 3HP. We, ho we hope this is uh, this uh, regimen. So I will uh, not uh, go in the uh, details uh, <clears throat> of the uh, dose. Again, it uh, will be uh, covered by some extent by other uh, uh, people. So the simple definition 3HP is a combination of isoniazid and trifepentine. Uh, for the duration of three months, so it's uh, 12 uh, uh, weekly uh, doses. Um, okay, so again, from the um, public health and TB programs uh, uh, perspective, what are the advantages of the uh, 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 3HP therapy? So it's approved by the FDA uh, for the treatment of LTBI. Again, it's recommended by the CDC. Initial recommendation came in 2011, and the uh, update was uh, just published uh, recently. Uh, this is a safer treatment in some uh, uh, um, 
so the, the treatment has lower uh, rates uh, of hepatotoxicity, uh, for example, compared to nine months of isoniazid. There is a flexibility of administration. It could be uh, used by DOT or SAT. Uh, um, and again, so even for DOT, for some programs, it, it is quite uh, possible to use it for DOT. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, simpler and shorter. Again, it's uh, just uh, 12 uh, doses uh, uh, versus uh, 120 doses for uh, four hours, 270 doses for nine months of isoniazid. Uh, uh, this regimen has high acceptance uh, by uh, uh, patients and uh, better adherence, uh, again, compared to a longer regimen. Uh, Another unique characteristic, again, because of the simplicity and the duration of this treatment, is uh, a, a potential use in immigrants actually prior to arrival to the uh, U.S. Uh, the CDC uh, currently is conducting a pilot study uh, in Vietnam to actually look at whether the 3-HP uh, could be uh, given to um, um, uh, patients, uh, to, uh, to uh, um, uh, U.S. inbound uh, immigrants who uh, um, um, are coming to the U.S. Um, um, as uh, um, uh, refugees or uh, as uh, on the family-based um, um, uh, immigration visas. So, um, which um, brings us to um, uh, uh, final slide. Uh, so, this is a new updated simulation model, which uh, shows, uh, um, which allows changes for TB transmission, immigration, and other TB uh, risk factors uh, determined. Uh, this model was developed in 2018 and published. So there are five uh, scenarios which were evaluated. Uh, uh, it's modeled from 2017 to 2000 uh, um, uh, to the year 100, and uh, again it looks at uh, different uh, uh, prevention and treatment activities. You, you could see the projected base uh, case on the top in black, and again different scenarios. And what is interesting, two interventions which are highlighted in green uh, here. Uh, one is the <clears throat> increased uptake of the latent TB infection screening and treatment among high-risk uh, population, including uptake, increasing uptake of the 3-HP uh, regimen. And uh, the second is actually a uh, 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 provision for latent TB infection testing and treatment of uh, uh, new legal immigrants, those are two interventions which have the highest uh, impact. And uh, actually, if you combine those two together, uh, uh, this uh, um, green arrow, which you could see, will actually uh, move down very close uh, to this uh, yellow line. Again, so we might not be able to achieve a full uh, TB elimination soon, but uh, what will bring us closer to this goal is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, um, simpler uh, uh, and shorter regimens uh, for LTBI, such as 3HP. So um, summary, again, from the U.S. public health uh, uh, perspective, as uh, declared by uh, Director of uh, uh, Division of TB Elimination uh, uh, of CDC, Phil Labou, and uh, John uh, Merman, the Director of the National Center and CHS STP. Uh, latent tuberculosis infection is the final frontier of the tuberculosis elimination in the U.S. Patients benefit from LTBI treatment by three. Uh, HP because 3-HP is safe, effective, has high rates of treatment acceptance and completion. And increased 3-HP is an essential component of the measures that have the most significant impact on TB elimination in the U.S. So um, 
Uh, that uh, that uh, a, a was a conclusion of, of my uh, first uh, part. And uh, Nila, uh, would you like me to proceed to the next uh, section? To the yes, that would, be, uh, that would be great. That would be great, Andre. And um, go go right on ahead. Okay. So uh, with uh, to be a recommendation update. Um, uh, the initial recommendations were published in 2011, and uh, they recommended 3-HP as a directly absorbed uh, therapy for LTBI, for treatment of LTBI in the U.S. It was uh, recommended uh, that it's uh, used for uh, uh, adults, and uh, uh, there was a, a provision of using it for children older than 12 years old, but... Uh, <clears throat> recommendation for use uh, in children under 12 years old and in person living with HIV AIDS, uh, specifically those on IRTs, those recommendations were limited. Uh, also, uh, again, so it was re uh, recommended to be used specifically as DOT treatment uh, because uh, missed uh, doses, altered dosing intervals and uh, amounts can actually jeopardize the uh, treatment completion, therefore jeopardizing uh, efficacy of the uh, regimen. New studies have been published since 2011. I will uh, not go through uh, all uh, this list, but uh, again, briefly, uh, there were uh, uh, all studies which uh, looked um, in uh, various programmatic settings at uh, safety uh, of 3HP and treatment completion of 3HP study was conducted by the tuberculosis uh, uh, studies, uh, epidemiological studies consortium. Uh, there, were no, there was a number of studies conducted by the CDC tuberculosis uh, trials consortium uh, <clears throat> a study on um, uh, um, uh, looking at the uh, use of 3HP in uh, children, in young children, and uh, in uh, patients with uh, HIV, as well as a study uh, um, looking at the SAT. Uh, in 2017, CDC uh, convened a review and uh, convened a work group uh, which was tasked uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, review and update of 2011 recommendations. Uh, our work group identified the need of the expansion of recommendations in uh, those uh, three major uh, areas I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, <clears throat> and the uh, CDC work group conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, uh, specifically looking at uh, literature from 1995 to 2017. Uh, it was very really, uh, a structured uh, process with uh, two independent reviewers, which were screening the literature abstract in data, uh, so specifically uh, looking at the outcomes of TB prevention, treatment completion, uh, safety, uh, and so forth. Uh, each uh, study which was uh, um, uh, um, uh, looked at was assessed for internal and external validity. Uh, then uh, we conducted a meta-analysis uh, of the data and the results were uh, published uh, earlier this uh, year in the uh, Journal of uh, Preventive Medicine. Um, Let me go to the next slide. Um, so the CDC uh, work group reviewed the results of the systematic review and meta-analysis, interpret the results uh, as related to these three major areas, uh, specifically um, uh, that uh, uh, 3HP is safe and effective, non-inferior to other LTBI uh, regimen in children 2 to 11 uh, when administered by uh, DOT. Uh, 3HP is uh, safe and effective in preventing active TB in persons infected with HIV AIDS. 
uh, and uh, also uh, the completion of 3HP uh, given uh, by um, uh, DOT and the SAT is uh, higher than uh, completion rates for other uh, longer uh, treatments, LTBI uh, treatments. Um, so the next uh, uh, process was uh, the work group uh, had a consultation with uh, nine um, subject matter experts. Uh, the names are listed here um, and uh, um, who provided uh, uh, <clears throat> individual uh, viewpoints uh, um, on uh, both on the presented literature review and meta-analysis and uh, on the uh, first draft of the recommendation uh, statements. So after uh, uh, this uh, um, was uh, incorporated in the next draft, the CDC presented next draft to the Advisory Council of TB Elimination and uh, uh, it was discussed at the ASET uh, meeting, and uh, there was a, a specific um, uh, um, recommendations. Uh, I'm sorry, specific recommendations uh, made by the ASET. Uh, um, uh, so the, it was recommended that the CDC considers. Uh, uh, permitting the use of uh, safe self-administered uh, treatment in uh, not only in adults but also in uh, children age uh, two years old and uh, uh, older. Um, also uh, at the same time noting that, that uh, certain uh, uh, populations again for example in children age two to five it might be uh, preferable uh, to uh, have it under DOT. Um, so, and uh, again, ACET uh, uh, discussed and formally recommended consideration of expansion of the option of parentally administered SAT to uh, children uh, two years old and uh, older. So, here are the <coughs> um, uh, summary of the new guidelines. So uh, CDC continues to recommend 3HP for treatment of LTBI in adults. Uh, it also recommends use of 3HP in persons age now from two years old to 17. Again, the previous recommendation recommended it from 12 to 17. So that was uh, lowered to age of two. Uh, now the 3HP is recommended uh, uh, for treatment of LTBI for uh, patients living with HIV infection, including uh, uh, AIDS and those who are taking antiretroviral medications. Um, however, uh, it should be noted that uh, uh, each individual uh, antiretroviral should be check to uh, ensure that there is no significant drug-drug uh, interactions. So the, um, uh, these uh, interactions are available, information is available, it's uh, constantly updated, so we uh, did not include uh, specific interactions as part of our statements rather than uh, referring to a living document which actually shows uh, those uh, uh, interactions. And uh, the, uh, the third uh, statement uh, is uh, actually allowing using the 3HP of uh, uh, both by DOT or SAT in persons uh, age uh, two years old and older. And uh, uh, with uh, uh, provision that the provider should choose DOT versus uh, SAT based on local practice, patient attributes and preferences, and other considerations. Separately to the main recommendations, uh, there was a guidance uh, on uh, to providers on monitoring um, 
I will uh, not go uh, through each of these statements because, again, we will have an opportunity to discuss uh, some of them uh, as the other speakers are presenting. Uh, so, um, again, so we could uh, come back to those uh, guidances. Uh, um, so, uh, but the guidance we have done in uh, uh, several areas, one in the guidance in regards to monitoring, another guidance and uh, to providers in regards to safety of uh, 3HP. And again, those are some of the statements um, uh, in regards to the uh, safety and uh, uh, also guidance to providers on uh, interaction. And again, so um, uh, 3HP being uh, 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 interacting with a number of medications, uh, 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 so they did monitoring, close monitoring is uh, advised. Uh, also, uh, rifapentin can reduce the effectiveness of uh, hormonal contraceptives. So women who rely on uh, hormonal birth control should be advised to ice. Uh, add switch or um, uh, uh, to a barrier um, methods. Uh, <clears throat> so here we um, have some uh, information uh, about what uh, to do and how to report any uh, treatment associated adverse events which uh, were serious in nature. Uh, they led to hospitalization or to death. Uh, so those adverse events uh, could be reported uh, to uh, CDC and uh, uh, to the FDA, uh, um, to the CDC through the National Surveillance for Severe Adverse Events associated with treatment for LTBI and uh, to the FDA uh, um, uh, through the MedWatch uh, online uh, system. Um, we also uh, have the direct uh, links to uh, 3HP uh, guidelines, but uh, I encourage uh, everyone to actually uh, come to the CDC websites to the publications. So it's cdc.gov slash tb slash publications. And besides the guidelines, there are other other materials are there uh, which could be uh, used um, uh, as you uh, prescribe uh, and uh, monitor patients uh, on 3HP. Uh, so I, here I would like to conclude my uh, presentation and uh, um, switch uh, back to Nila. Thank you so much, Andre. And from here, we'll, we'll keep the story going. We're going to switch over to Dr. David Griffith. Um, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about some of the ph pharmacology of rifapentine and specifically speak to interactions um, that might be of concern to folks and using it with isoniazid. By way of background, Dr. Griffith joined the faculty of University of Texas Health Science Center, uh, Tyler, back in 1985. He's board certified in internal medicine and pulmonary medicine, and he's currently a professor of medicine and pulmonary infectious disease division chief um, at UTH SDT. He's the program director at the Texas Center for Infectious Diseases in San Antonio and assistant medical director for the Heartland National TB Center, which is also based in San Antonio, Texas. And since 2002, he's held the William A. Elizabeth B. Distinguished Professorship Chair at UTHSCT. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Griffith to talk us through some of the more deep dive questions when it comes to rifapentine and INH. Thanks very much, Neela, <clears throat> and uh, welcome to everyone this afternoon. Uh, my disclosures are essentially the same as Dr. Borisov, and I have no pertinent uh, conflicts of, of interest. Uh, as Neela said, I'm going to talk a little bit about rifapentine, which may be um, a little uh, unfamiliar to some folks. Uh, rifapentine is a rifampin derivative, um, as with the rif all rifamycins. It binds to the beta subunit of the uh, organism's DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, inhibiting messenger RNA uh, elongation. It is, as with other rifamycins, bactericidal against extracellular organisms. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and due to the shared mechanism of, of action uh, between the rifamycins, I think everyone is familiar, there is cross resistance uh, among uh, each of the uh, rifamycins. So uh, this drug is not uh, effective against rifampin resistant organisms. As you can see, there's a similar spectrum of activity um, microbiologically. Uh, although the MIC against uh, MTB for rifapentine is lower than that for uh, rifampin. Um, both rifapentine uh, and its um, uh, somewhat active metabolite are uh, eliminated primarily via the biliary tract. The half-life of rif rifapentine is 14 to 16 hours. Uh, something that's very important, food significantly impacts rifapentine's bioavailability. Uh, meals can actually increase rifapentine's exposure from 33% to 86%, uh, depending on meal composition, with high-fat meals having the greatest increase in bioavailability. This increase in bioavailability when in administered with food is the opposite of rifampin, uh, where bioavailability decreases with food administration. This is looking at dosing of rifapentine. As you can see, rifapentine is available um, as a 150 milligram tablet for oral administration. It can be crushed for pediatric dosing. For adults and children greater than 45 kilograms, the dose is uh, for the 3HP regimen is 900 milligrams uh, once weekly. Uh, I borrowed this slide from my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Seaworth, uh, because that's a lot of pills. Uh, the pill burden with 3-HP can be a problem. Uh, it's 10 pills currently for uh, an adult or a child more than uh, 45 kilos. Uh, in the future, with combination pills, uh, that administration will hopefully get a little bit uh, easier. Um, rifapentine is also safe at doses greater than 900 milligrams, either given daily or uh, weekly. Now, the rifapentine uh, plasma concentration uh, versus, versus dose curve does not increase proportionately, so that if you double the dose, you, do not, uh, you don't get uh, a, a doubling of the concentration either of the area under the curve or the, uh, the Cmax. Um, and, and I think that's why uh, the rifapentine dose of 900 milligrams was picked. Um, so there, uh, something very important, Dose modification by weight uh, is not necessary for adults uh, with the 3-HP uh, regimen. Um, this is, a, I think, uh, an important slide uh, because uh, it summarizes some of why rifapentine may especially be suited uh, for use for TB infection. Uh, rifapentine binds to the organism's DNA-dependent RNA even with low enzyme activity as might be seen with dormant mycobacteria. Rifapentine also accumulates in human granulomas with intracellular to extracellular ratios of 24 to 1. And this ratio of intracellular extracellular penetration of rifapentine is about four to five fold higher than that of rifampin. So uh, it, it looks like uh, from a uh, pathophysiologic standpoint that rifapentine would have advantages uh, in treating uh, TB infection. This slide summarizes those differences uh, or the similarities and differences we, uh, we've discussed between rifampin and rifapentine. As you can see, um, uh, the MIC for the uh, organism is very similar with rifapentine having a little bit of an edge. Half-life is considerably higher. There is also considerably higher protein binding of uh, rifapentine. We discussed the uh, food requirement. Uh, hepatic enzyme induction um, is comparable uh, between the drugs, um, uh, and cavitary penetration is actually better with, uh, with rifampin. Um, looking at rifamycin toxicity, the uh, toxicities for rifapentine are uh, very similar to, uh, to rifampin. Uh, I think uh, folks are very, uh, very familiar with these. Uh, the flu-like uh, symptoms that can occur, particularly with intermittent therapy, and then the the unusual but but uh, somewhat um, uh, worrisome immunologic mediated reactions like thrombocytopenia, uh, thrombocytopenia hemolytic anemia, uh, renal failure, 
uh, and thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, purpura. Um, <clears throat> interesting, uh, severe hepa uh, hepatotoxicity is almost unknown with uh, rifampin monotherapy. And uh, I would assume that, that uh, the safety uh, in terms of severe hepatotoxicity would also translate to uh, rifapentine as well. Uh, but of course, the uh, uh, the major concern uh, with the rifamycins uh, are the interactions uh, with uh, due to induction of hepatic microsomal uh, enzymes accelerating metabolism of uh, multiple drugs. And uh, the major concern uh, is always reduction in common drugs like birth control pills uh, and anticoagulants, uh, et cetera. There is an interesting bidirectional interaction between the rifamycins and INH for some of these agents and as, as well as with some of the antiretroviral agents, although I think uh, that is difficult uh, to predict. So this is looking at uh, just some common rifamycin drug uh, interactions, uh, statins, anticoagulants, oral contraceptives, anti-rejection medications, steroids, antifungals, methadone, anti-seizure medications, uh, cardiac medications. Uh, I, I think this slide just emphasizes the point. It is absolutely necessary to review all possible interactions between rifamycins uh, and a patient's uh, 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 routine medications. Um, this slide is just a demonstration of the profound interaction between rifamycin and multiple uh, antiretroviral uh, medications. Now, as uh, Andre mentioned, uh, there, there is uh, or there are a couple of um, antiretroviral regimens based on uh, efavirenz or raltelgravir. Uh, that are acceptable uh, for use with 3-HB. Uh, you can see on the slide the companion medications uh, with, with those two uh, that may be acceptable. There is also uh, a link uh, to information uh, more specific about uh, guiding that. I think on a later slide we've got that uh, using 3-HP in the setting of HIV seropositivity is something that should be done uh, in concert uh, with an expert, but I think it is important to point out that not every HIV seropositive person uh, on antiretroviral therapy is automatically uh, disqualified from 3-HP. Um, I wanted to talk specifically about 3-HP with uh, and hepatotoxicity. Uh, this is one of the uh, recent large uh, trials. Um, uh, comparing 3-HP to uh, nine months of isoniazid, uh, as you can see uh, in this study, about 1% of patients developed uh, hepatotoxicity. Uh, the majority of those people were on isoniazid with a, with a significantly greater occurrence of hepatotoxicity with isoniazid versus uh, 3-HP. The risk factors for hepatotoxicity identified in this study were age, female sex, white race, non-Hispanic ethnicity, decreased body mass index, and elevated baseline AST, and of course, uh, the use of isoniazid. And the authors point out that uh, for uh, individuals with those risk factors, uh, 3-HP might be preferable to uh, INH. Um, I would point out that these results are, are very reproducible, very consistent with each of the large studies that have been done looking at 3-HP versus isoniazid, uh, including the two studies uh, from uh, Tim Sterling, one in the New England Journal and one from AIDS, and one from Dr. Martinson from uh, the New England Journal. In other words, this the, the superiority of 3-HP to isoniazid and the incidence of hepatotoxicity is very consistent and, uh, and re reproducible. An interesting, uh, perhaps unanticipated uh, finding uh, has been the um, systemic drug reactions that, that, that rarely occur uh, with uh, 3-HP. Uh, this is a, a, a study from, uh, also from Dr. Sterling. Um, 
they noticed 153 uh, individuals who had a systemic drug reaction. You can see it was significantly more common in the 3-HP arm than the isoniazid arm. Most were flu-like syndrome, uh, some were hypersensitivity reactions, but there were uh, some severe reactions, including hypotension and uh, syncope. Um, the symptoms occurred after a medium of three doses and generally four hours after the uh, dose uh, was, was taken. Um, there were no deaths or uh, permanent sequelae from uh, these reactions, no Stevens-Johnson uh, syndrome, um, no toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis or drug reaction with eosinophilia, one episode of thrombocytopenia, uh, anemia, and neutropenia, no renal failure. And I think it's important that the underlying mechanism for these uh, systemic drug reactions is not clear. In other words, it, uh, uh, Dr. Sterling in this uh, manuscript and his co-authors uh, were not certain that this was an immunologically uh, mediated uh, event. So the other question is, what about patients who have uh, a, an adverse reaction while they're taking 3-HP? And uh, in the manuscript uh, from Dr. Sterling, the decisions regarding rechallenge were made by uh, the investigator. About half the persistent, uh, participants, and uh, including all of the ones with severe events, were not uh, rechallenged. And I think this is important. They felt it was difficult to ascertain whether isoniazid, rifapentine, or the combination was uh, the cause of these uh, reactions. The other uh, important point here is that there were no early clinical predictors of which patients were going to uh, uh, have, uh, have one of these uh, uh, events. Um, but I, you know, this is an important, uh, uh, an important problem uh, that I, is unique, as far as I know, in terms of uh, uh, tuberculosis infection regimens. Uh, so that if you have 3HP, you have to be aware that patients can have uh, some unusual uh, problems, such as uh, hypotension and, and syncope. I want to mention uh, INH hepatotoxicity just briefly. I know um, uh, folks are very familiar with this. Uh, this slide uh, just points out the uh, relative frequency of hepatotoxic events. Uh, with fulminant uh, hepatitis and hepatic failure occurring somewhere in about four in 100,000 persons uh, completing INH therapy. I included this slide because it is a review, uh, a detailed review by the CDC of uh, patients who had uh, severe um, uh, uh, hepatic events uh, with INH. Um, the, um, the, the important thing is that um, as long as INH is in the regimen, um, there is, I think, a risk for uh, fulminant hepatic failure uh, due to INH. Um, and uh, if you look at the bottom line, there were some disconcerting aspects of this investigation. Two patients with INH discontinued it within three days of, uh, of symptoms, um, and uh, eight stopped at least one week uh, after symptom onset. So while it hasn't been seen yet, I don't think it's been reported yet, um, I, I don't think it can be ignored. Uh, and frankly, uh, the, um, the fact that, uh, that it, it can exist uh, for all people who are on 3HP, as with anybody who's receiving INH uh, uh, therapy for TBI, uh, that INH has to be stopped at the earliest onset of symptoms suggesting uh, hepatitis. Um, I also think that, um, you know, we're going to talk, uh, Dr. Ashkin is going to talk about the advantages of adherence and efficacy for, uh, for DOT. I think uh, from the standpoint of toxicity monitoring, uh, DOT is also advantageous in this regimen. I included this slide uh, because it, it, this is from a recent uh, meta-analysis of uh, uh, TB, TBI therapy, including uh, safety and hepatotoxicity, 
and it ranks the uh, relative safety of the regimens. And I would just point out, I'm sorry, I, uh, I can't do it from my computer, but uh, the two regimens with the, that are, appear the safest from the standpoint of hepatotoxicity are rifampin and uh, 3-HP. Uh, so um, I can summarize, this is, uh, uh, Andre uh, showed these slides uh, 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 partially. This is the recommendations for monitoring. And the, the monitoring recommendations can be summarized very uh, simply. These are the same uh, recommendations or guidance as for uh, monitoring INH therapy. Uh, I, I don't think uh, in the... In, in terms of, in, in other words, it's mostly looking at hepatotoxicity, and I don't think the rifapentine um, adds much uh, uh, to that. And in terms of uh, use in HIV in HIV infected people, uh, as Andreas pointed out, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, use of concomitant uh, LTBI th treatment and antiretroviral agents should be guided by clinicians experienced in the management of both. Uh, conditions. So uh, I'm, Andre also showed this slide, so I'm going to move through that. Um, I want to um, just ask, uh, we, we can come back to these questions, uh, but it, one of them is, can I use 3-HP in patients with liver problems? I think the answer is yes, but it's not necessarily the uh, safest uh, uh, regimen. Um, someone had asked about cost. And so for 12 weeks of rifapentine, this is the cost uh, in our uh, pharmacy. It is covered by insurance. And of course, uh, copay would depend on the type of insurance uh, available. Now, uh, very quickly, these are uh, current uh, treatment options for latent uh, infection. Um, and I, I, wanted, I wanted to to bring this up because uh, for many years uh, I have been using uh, rifampin uh, for uh, our employees at, at my hospital and for the people in my region in the in the state of Texas with with frankly not a lot of evidence. But uh, when I wanted to give INH to employees, uh, they frequently balked. Uh, so uh, I, I switched to rifampin some time ago. Well, it turns out. Just within the last uh, couple of months, Dr. Menzies, uh, in an article through the New England Journal, uh, has demonstrated that rifampin for four months is not uh, inferior to nine months of INH, and that treatment completion uh, and hepatotoxicity is less with rifampin uh, than with INH. So I, I think uh, rif uh, rifampin monotherapy for four months is a good regimen, and for patients with 3-HP who have INH problems is certainly a very good substitute uh, for, for uh, the 3-HP. And then lastly, um, I know that uh, moxifloxacin is used for treatment of TBI uh, for patients who are, uh, have multidrug resistant exposures, and for some patients, for instance, who have hepatotoxicity. This is one study. Uh, that our friend uh, Sundry Mace uh, was senior author, uh, looking at moxifloxacin and levofloxacin uh, for uh, contacts of multidrug resistant cases, and uh, it appeared to be um, it, it appeared to be effective. Unfortunately, I, uh, these folks uh, got 12 months of fluoroquinolone therapy, and I'm not real sure where the six month fluoroquinolone recommendation came from. Uh, but it, it is an option, and perhaps we can uh, uh, discuss it at a, at a later time. So let me stop here so we have enough time for Dr. Ashkin's presentation. Hello. Thank you. So Hi there. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, so at this point, we'll go ahead and switch over to Dr. Ashkin, who comes to us as the medical director and co-principal investigator for the Southeastern National TB Center. Um, as the current medical director of the Florida Department of Health program, Dr. Ashkin is responsible for the medical management of all of Florida's TB patients, including those most complex cases, which are hospitalized at the state's two contracted TB units. 
He's a board certified pulmonologist and intensivist who trained at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in New York during their outbreak of multi-drug resistant TB. And he did his pulmonary fellowship at the University of Miami during their outbreak. Um, he's published extensively on the care and treatment of TB. And he's also served on Florida and national advisory panels for controlling TB and was instrumental in restructuring the Florida TB program to better address TB elimination in the state. Um, Dr. Ashkin, with that, we will switch over to you um, to take us through some of the practical issues related to 3HP administration. Um, and I'll just also uh, put a request out there to please feel free to put in questions in the box. And we do have some additional slides as well that we may circle back to um, towards the end of the webinar. Thanks. Yela, thank you very, very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really just an honor to be here today. And I want to thank uh, the Heartland and the uh, Center for allowing me to speak here today. And uh, I really want to thank uh, Dave and uh, Andre for great presentations. And uh, I also want to, you know, as I'm looking at these studies, I want to thank all the people who have done these amazing studies, uh, you know, because a lot of the questions uh, that we all have in these regiments, uh, you know, would not be possible without uh, groups like the TBPC. So I think it's important to acknowledge them. And while I'm acknowledging them, I have to tell you that uh, I have a little issues today. Um, and that's why I think, uh, you know, they gave me to talk about issues with 3HP. I, I have issues. Anybody who knows me knows uh, I have issues. And the biggest issue I have today, well, two issues. One is that, uh, you know, Dave and Andre had all these great slides of studies that were done that really definitively gave some very nice answers. Uh, they gave me, of course, the topic that pretty much there is not much uh, support, or if there is little or not nearly as good. And, you know, I, I have to be honest with you, you know, it's, it, you know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, the questions that I've been posed and what I'm going to share with you today, a lot of it is going to be based on either little evidence or, you know, let's say evidence that's hard to support and may not exist. And that's why I really, you know, and I know there may be little kids listening, so you know how little kids always listen about TV, so that goes without saying. So I don't want to say anything about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, but obviously, you know, when you have uh, to talk about uh, topics that there may not be much support, who else should you be asking for advice? So Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, I'm going to ask them to support me today. As far as uh, disclosures, uh, no, you know, anything I say today is pretty much based on my own personal opinions uh, and what I, you know, what we'll share. And obviously, nobody's going to take any uh, credit or at least uh, that nobody's going to support what I say anyway. So, um, you know, the other pet peeve I told you is one is that uh, a lot of stuff we're going to talk about today. There's not a lot that we're going to talk about. What's, we're going to base that on some reviews of what literature may exist or some abstract and just knowledge of uh, of what's going on in the community. But the second thing that's a pet peeve of mine is, I gotta be honest with you, I hate talking about LTBI. At least I hated to talk about LTBI until recently. Because, you know, when you talk about prevention, you know, everybody always talks about, you know, an uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But anybody who's in the field knows when you talk about prevention, it's, it's very difficult. Because you're pretty much gonna be treating people who have no symptoms. And you tell them about how there may be a disease later on but the bottom line is, I think our old, our colleague uh, George Comstock said it well when he said, although an ounce of prevention may often be worth a pound of cure, there's an inherent and unfortunate tendency for prevention to be discouraging. And boy, in my opinion, has the history of LTBI treatment and diagnosis, has that been discouraging? And this is an old slide, but this is where a lot of us who have right here really felt, you know, there were so many, so many people we would screen for LTBI. We would then place the TPD, and we would know that most of them would not come back. And if they did come back, only about 10% were positive. And we dealt with TPDs. And I know there's some questions about arguments. You know, the bottom line is we knew about 20% were false negative, 20% were false positive. We then had to get x-rays for these patients. And then we started them on therapy. And we all know that of the majority of patients that we started on IMH, in most situations, very few completed. And that was frustrating, and we really needed new weapons. And what I guess is exciting now is we do have some new weapons. And that's what I really like to talk and we've been talking about today. But, you know, I think one of the biggest things we've got to do is we need to invigorate us again that there is stuff we can do. We can make a difference because I think a lot of us in the TV community have become somewhat, let's say, discouraged, you know. So I think we need to change. I think this is a call to really change what, how we do things. 
So the first thing I think is really important that we'll talk about real briefly is, you know, we always talk about the decision to test and the decision to treat, but we must change this. We must change it and complete this. And we must say the decision to test and the decision to treat is the decision to treat. And most importantly, we have to add and complete. And why is that? Because as Dave alluded to, the bottom line is the most important thing we can do is complete these regimens. You know, it's ironic to me, to be honest, that all these studies, and Dave even alluded to Dick's uh, recent study, you know, that based on a meta-analysis of INH is comparable to rifampin. The bottom line is, let's cut right to the chase, right? The bottom line is all these regimens are really good at preventing TB. And at the end of the day, the real thing that changes everything is not the efficacy of this regimen, because they're all good, is that it's all about adherence. You know, in TB, you know, we always talk about, you know, airborne isolation, uh, you know, airborne infection isolation, AII, inverse of AI. This is, it's all about adherence, IAAA meeting. If you look at this slide real quick, if you had 100 patients in Regimen 1 and Regimen 2, let's say Regimen 1 was really much, much better, which I have to say to you, none of these regimens really have much of a difference. As a matter of fact, if you look at most of the studies, less than 1%, way less than 1%, a patient who get any of these regimens really come down with active disease, and they're very close. But if you look at regimen one, even if regimen one is 90%, right, 90 of those patients would be protected. And even if you take a regimen two, even if it's 70%, still 70% protected. When if you just look at efficacy, even when there's a difference, regimen one looks better. But in reality, it's really completion. It's really adherence that makes the if only 50% of patients take regimen one, let's say regimen one is INH, where, as Andre alluded to, in certain situations, less than 30% complete INH, that even if it was really that much better, as it's the only 46 or 45 patients are protected. Whereas if regimen two, like we could take four, you know, four months of refamp and the three HHP, where most programs are now getting 70, 80, 90%, you know, adherence, now you can see that's what really makes the difference. So I want to emphasize to you, it's really all about adherence. You know, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to get into the practicalities here. So we uh, went out and we asked you guys, uh, you know, give us some questions. What do you think some issues are? And you can see this list of questions, and I'd really like to go through them real briefly to leave some questions so we can open the questions to you. But I want to kind of review these, and I want to emphasize to you where we are, and we have a lot to learn. But the bottom line is, first of all, the question we got is, are the pediatric formulations of 3-HP? And the short answer is right now, no. But here's the good news. You know, the TBTC, who, again, I really want to, the CDC and their support of the TBTC has been phenomenal. And I want to say right now they're investigating a mango flavor. To, actually, they went through a whole list of, you know, what would be the best flavor? You know, and again, remember, this is international, and they found mango was the most tolerable. And being here in Florida, I agree with them. Uh, and they, what they have is a new fixed test of this, those uh, dispersal, meaning when it, it touches their tongue, it pretty much dissolves, so there's no swallowing. And they're, they're testing that right now. But the bottom line is, is that that's not available at the second. If you look at the studies, the, um, the studies, um, the, studies, the way they did the studies, for the most part, uh, for those children who couldn't swallow tablets, they just uh, crushed the uh, iron H and the rifampicin tablets and they made it into a slurry. And they gave it with soft food. And as Dave talked about, actually, rifampicin is better with dog with food. And they usually use chocolate-based uh, pudding. And remember, there's very little, you know, uh, uh, dairy products in those. Uh, so, you know, but, it, you know, they, it worked well. Um, they tried to stay away from food-based, uh, so they didn't have as much in interference. Um, you know, so that's what most of us are doing right now. You can compound the medication, but it makes it much, much more expensive. So the next question you were asked is, you know, or, you know has been an issue is, what about 3 HP for window prophylaxis as we're talking about kids? These are kids who've been exposed, their PPD or their eyebrow test, or, you know, maybe negative depending on their age. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, we're waiting. You know, and there's been a lot of, like, angst, at least here in Florida, about a lot of clinicians don't feel comfortable with treating somebody weekly while they're waiting if that kid was infected. But I want to emphasize, you know, if you look at the studies, as was alluded to by, uh, as that Elsa did, they took kids who were in the window, um, you know, prophylactic period, and they seemed to work, you know. But still, I just want to bring out that some clinicians feel uneasy and they rather use daily, but it looks like it worked uh, in, in the studies that were done. You know, the other questions that they've asked, you know, is, uh, is 3-HP appropriate for immunosuppression? 
individuals. And I want to emphasize, outside of the HIV, there's really no good long studies being, uh, that have been looked at. But remember, the original studies uh, that were done, they did include uh, patients who had some immunosuppressed uh, conditions like diabetes, and it seemed to be efficacious. There was no patients on tumor necrosis factor blockers that were included, at least uh, not that were reported. And, and the bottom line is there's really no large studies that look at what about patients on tumor, you know, is this suitable? But I have to say, uh, you know, the, again, same thing, it looks like it works. You know, so again, I want to caution that many people feel, and some clinicians may feel a little cautious about this. They'd rather go with like a, either nine months of INH or, or four months of rifampin. Again, there's just no good data. I think the biggest issues, as always, are always, you know, how long do you wait on 3 HP? And again, there's really no good data. Some of us would say, and, and I want to emphasize, like everything else that Dave alluded to, it always depends on the patient. If you have a patient that needs two necrosis factor blockers, that they are so sick, you can't wait. And usually we'll start them, you know, if we have to, we'll start them both together. But if you can wait, you usually like to wait. And there's no really good studies for most people who say about a month if you can, you know. Um, and then what about other cases? You know, what about like patients who are going on tumor necrosis factor blocks for rheumatoid arthritis? Interestingly enough, there's a, there's a couple of good case studies that look like 3-HP actually work in this group. That's a little, uh, you know, that, that, that helps us. And what about, the, you know, transplant patients? And again, interestingly enough, and Dave alluded to this, and I want to, you know, I, I hate, this kills me. I hate to uh, agree with Dave, but Dave uh, alluded to this, you know, what about 3-HP in patients with liver disease? And these were patients who had end-stage liver disease waiting for transplant. And I do want to emphasize, it was a small study. It looked about eight cases. But they were able to successfully use 3-HP. Uh, there was also a case of the renal of patients who were going, going for transplants, and they were able to use uh, 3-HP in that group. And I'm very, very happy to say that, at least in this very small study, it, it looked like it was well tolerated. And obviously, as far as, uh, you know, efficacy, it looked like it worked, but I think we need more, more data. I think it's way too small. Obviously, uh, the biggest issue with 3-HP post-transplant would be, uh, you know, that the fact that risk tends to may interfere, like Dave said, with the, uh, the suppre immunosuppressive drug. And just a real quick, in our experience, we've used it, but I really would uh, a shout out to my colleague who's on this, Chuck Pelliquin, and his, his lab and other labs in the, in the country that do uh, TDM, therapeutic drug monitoring, is really helpful in this case. But again, we really just don't have a lot of uh, information. And then lastly, what about HIV? And this has been alluded to. I'm just going to jump right, you know, just real quickly because Andre had already gone through. There was the Prevent TB study. I'm very glad that they did an HIV positive individual. It was clear that the HIV. That, I'm just getting a little feedback. Can we, um, can we mute the, thank you. Um, but either way, sorry about that. Um, in the HIV positive individuals, what happened was is that uh, it seemed to have worked. And the only issue is they did without antiretroviral, but as was alluded to, there are new studies now that are looking at risk team really has very little interactions with raltegravir and ephedrine, so we do have options, and that's usually what we recommend while we have somebody on 3-HP. You know, what about 3-HP in the homeless population? And you know, there have been a number of posters by many of you out there right now that have shown that you guys are able to actually use it in the homeless populations, especially when it's tied to like shelter cards or the, the shelter um, admission process itself. Um, so, you know, it seems to be successful. And remember, the original study, study 26, actually included patients who are homeless that were in shelters. So one of the places I think that 3-HP, and, you know, it has been shown to work, looks like among homeless, you know. Um, what about in other nursing, what about in other kinds of settings? And again, there's been some nice studies by you guys, again, in jails. And remember, the whole idea of jails is those patients aren't in jails very long. As a matter of fact, uh, 50% of people admitted to jails are, are there less than 48 hours. Obviously, in that population, that's not to be as effective. But interestingly enough, for those who are actually there more than a week, um, there's a good chance that they may actually be there for a couple of months, and 3-HP may be a very, very effective way. But again, there would have to be co coordination between the jails and the health department. So once they're discharged, we have that handoff so they can complete. And obviously, in other kinds of long-term kind of good settings, you know, where patients may be there for months or years, the shortness of the regimen towards completion may not be as important because you have more time. But as alluded to by Andre, every time you, you look at studies, any regimen that's taken shorter 
teams have better experience. So I think there is a role for you to three HP or 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 refamp and perform up in the common setting. I want to take like a couple of minutes and we're gonna go to questions, but this has been the top topic. And the hot topic is what about self administered therapy or SAT? Um and can you know because as a literature, the original study was directly observed therapy of three HP for self-administered therapy of nine months of INH. So some people obviously said, hey, maybe the red team really isn't all that much better than nine months of INH. Maybe it was all just that you gave it by DOT. So that's why the I adhere study came out, looking at self-administered therapy versus directly observed therapy versus uh, electronic uh, you know, text messaging to remind. And I want to rec I want to just reiterate and, and really emphasize this point. Notice what the study shows. These results support using self-administered once weekly INH capacity to treat LTBI in the United States. That's kind of interesting because, as you know, the study was done not only in the United States but elsewhere. So why did they just say in the United States? And I do want to point this out because Andre, who you know, this, he was the principal, that he did an amazing study here. But I do want to show and remind people that in the study, actually self-administered therapy in outside the United States actually performed not, in an inferior me um, manner to direct insert therapy. So I think the point is, and Andre has told me this and I agree with him, it's not is directly insert therapy equal to self-administered therapy. I don't think there's any doubt that directly observed therapy is better and you have better outcomes with it. It's just that in the United States, it's just, interestingly enough, where I believe some of it is that people are more, uh, you know, uh, more accepting of LTBI, it was non-inferior. But if you look at the numbers, it did not perform as well as DOT. So if the question is, is DOT better? The answer is yes. And I think in those patients that we'll talk about, when you really have the highest risk, those patients were immunosuppressed, young children, you know, those uh, populations or individuals locally who you need to complete therapy, they're the ones where you need to make sure that you give directly observed therapy if you can. On the other hand, you know, if you have lesser mm -hmm. and, they, and, you, and you, they're not going to, and they're not going to accept it, I think self-administered is acceptable. So, you know, the other option now is video DOT, you know, where we actually use programs and phones to, uh, to you know, uh, present a, a to do direct observed therapy. And I have to say, this is a paper that just came out from our colleagues in New York City that very nicely showed that video DOT was as effective as DOT. And now the question comes down to things like, can you use Skype? Can you use other technologies? And the answer is, remember, some of the technologies are not HIP or approved. So as long as the patient agrees to do it and understands this list, you can do it. Otherwise, there are programs out there, programs out there that are designed for video DOT that are HIP or approved that more and more of us are using. So that is out there. I mean, it includes using the patient's own phones and apps. So I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this, you know. Um, and then, you know, just uh, to... Uh, Finish out, you know, can you use other people other than healthcare personnel to do DOT? And the answer is yes, there has been studies as long as, as always, both the patient is trained in video DOT, the staff who review it are trained in video DOT, and then lastly, if you can use staff outside the health department to make sure they understand what is expected of them exactly to count it as a DOT uh, uh, dose. So, um, because of um, the, the constraints of time, what I'd like to do is just end by saying, you know, I want to remind you that this is new, is relatively new, but the studies have been done have really shown a lot of effect, you know, effective use. But we're still learning at this point. We're learning about 3HP. We're learning about shorter courses that I believe, as alluded to by Andre, there's even going to be shorter and shorter courses. So, you know, unlike where I said before, I was very discouraged. This is a time of encouragement for LCDI. We have new, new tools to diagnose it that show that uh, it may be more specific, and we have better tools now to complete it. So remember, the new mantra is, right, the decision to test is the decision to treat and complete, and I want to thank all of you for sharing your experience and to continue to share your experience because we're all in this together. So happy holidays to you and your family. Neil, it's back to you. Thanks.
Thanks so much, Dave. Much appreciated. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in this webinar, and we have about 10 questions I tried to answer. There's been a flood of enthusiasm and activity here in the chat box. Um, so I tried to knock off some, but I think it'll be great if I give you guys about a minute to answer per question, and we can try to get through as many as we can. Um, the first here, I think, is for, for both of our Daves. Um, what would you see as the biggest contraindication to starting 3-HP treatment for a patient who's been determined to have LTBI just from a simple messaging standpoint? I know you all have gone through a whole lot of nuances, and every patient obviously has their own individual um, things that have to be thought about, but maybe broadly what you see as the biggest thing is to stay away from 3-HP. You want to go? You want to answer that? Well, uh, certainly, um, uh, the any retroviral therapy that would be contraindicated with rifamycin, um, and of course, anybody with a history of hypersensitivity uh, to rifamycin or isoniazid, and I don't think it's the best regimen for patients who have moderate to severe hepatic disease. I think there are, are better approaches uh, for that. Um, and, and of course, uh, the, the wide list of um, drug interactions that would be contraindicated for rifamycin administration. Uh, Dave, can you think of some, anything else? Yeah, Actually, I, I before you go there, I, I was just going to, sorry, I just want to chip in real quick because I know with the HIV comments, I just wanted to alert folks that for the most up-to-date drug interactions, a good resource is the aidsinfo.nih.gov. And just as um, Dr. Griffith alluded to, patients on some antiretrovirals and some of the newer agents you guys will see, of course, elvitegravir, dolutegravir, bictegravir, all of those are currently recommended to not co-administer with rifapentine. Um, but sorry, Dave Ashkin, go ahead. No, no, no. I agree with John said. And then, you know, the only other thing I would add is other drugs uh, where there may be an interaction, just, and then lastly, pregnant women. Um, obviously, there's really not a lot of data, you know, to support abuse in pregnant women. Um, but I agree with Dave on that first. That's great. That knocks off another question because we had a question about 3HP and pregnancy. So thank you for answering that one. Um, there was a question, I think this will be for Dave Griffith, I think it'll recap a question you had asked about the rate of flu-like syndrome um, compared between 3-HP and four months rifampin. Did your data cover that comparison? Um, you know, it wasn't reported uh, very much in the study by Menzies. So I think the flu-like syndrome uh, is considerably more uh, common with 3-HP <clears throat> compared to uh, daily rifampin, but it, it's still unusual. Uh, I don't want to, you know, it, it was it was an uncommon occurrence even with uh, 3-HP. Uh, Neela, is it okay if I if I cover a question I just sort of glossed over uh, during the presentation? Please, please go ahead. Okay, I, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people there's there's always a question is if somebody has uh, an, an an adverse event with 3-HP and it's uh, interrupted and you start another uh, ther uh, another therapy, how much credit does a patient get for the, the treatment that they've had with 3-HP? And of course, as with much of what we've talked about, you know, there's, there's not much data there. My inclination, and I'd be, uh, I, I would like to hear from Dave and Andre, um, frankly, I think if someone's had uh, a month or less of 3-HP, I would start over. But, uh, you know, if somebody's two months into 3-HP, they're two-thirds of the way through, I would be inclined to give them, if you will, uh, two-thirds credit toward completion of therapy with another regimen. So, Dave, Andre, what, what do you think? And while you guys are getting thoughts together, Linda, can you put up the slide um, from Dr. Ashkin on treatment interruptions? Because um, I know Thanks, that's what yeah. you all are too. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, and, and I, it's killing me to, to say this, so, but I, uh, I, I agree with Dave to an extent, um, and, and that's all I can agree to Dave. I mean, there's, there's limitations, um, but, you know, I, I think it really all comes down to the person. I have to be honest with you. If I have somebody who's really immunosuppressed and I have to stop therapy, I need to make sure 
that person really completed therapy. And I probably would have a less of a tolerance or less of a, a, a you know, a, 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 you know, an initiative to, uh, you know, give credit. I think in those cases, I got to make sure that person really completes. Um, whereas if you have somebody who's, you know, relatively immunocompetent, um, I agree with you 100%, Dave. I, I think, uh, you know, the issue comes down to is that to give credit. And I, but I think there is two different, if I may, there's two different questions here. One is, what do you do to the person, with the person who, um, who, you know, you had to stop therapy because of the side effect? You know, do you restart that and try to complete? And again, you know, when we talk about completion of 3-HP, I want to make this point. The studies looked at, even though it's 12, it's 12 doses of 3-HP, all they consider to be a completed, uh, you know, to, to complete the regimen was 11 doses within a 16-week period. So let me say that again, 11 doses within a 16-week period. So I agree with what they said before, which is that, you know, if you have somebody who's there's the response, the, the, the reaction wasn't really that bad and you feel like you want to restart, I think you should restart it. But on the other hand, I like they said, yeah, somebody who had a really severe reaction, and as the studies did is if the investigator, if the clinician felt that it was so severe they did not want to restart it, then I think you have to go back and look at the patient again. Like, what was the risk factors? Why did you treat this person? And again, in my opinion, if they're really severely immunosuppressed, I think you need to guarantee they get the full regimen, uh, meaning if you have to switch. But again, I agree with Dave that if it's not somebody who's severely immunosuppressed, I think giving some credit, and usually we talk about like percentages, meaning if they got, let's say, four doses of 3-HP, that would be 33%. You might be able to, instead of giving, you know, four months of rifampin, maybe give three months. You know, again, but I want to emphasize that that advice came from the Easter Bunny and the San and Santa Claus. And let's just say that it, they, just like them, it may be hard to prove. Thanks, Dave. Hey, you and, um, there, there are many, many questions. So I think what we will try to do is um, do some aggregate responses to some of these questions and send out to participants. Um, in the remaining minutes, there is one that would be nice maybe to hear your all's philosophical answer to um, where someone asks, with the 3-HP regimen, um, if we're switching over to self-administered therapy, they're kind of asking, um, how, do we, how do we monitor patient compliance? Should we get some labs? Should we get peak and trough labs to look for presence of the medication in the blood? Yeah, so if I could just agree, you know, just on behalf of uh, Chuck, uh, you know, I, I would, I don't think peak and trough labs is a really great way to monitor adherence just because it's really uh, a point in time. All I can tell you is on that day, that person took their, their meds. You know, it, you, it's not, it doesn't say they took it all the other time, but on that day, they took their meds or not. It may not even be that they took their meds because of absorption issues. So it's, it's a little hard. Um, I think this is where you're stuck again. You know, it's like anything else. You know, right now the there are technologies out there, uh, but they're not really ready for prime time yet, you know, where you can actually tell if the person opened the cap. There's even new technology that you can actually tell if the pill hits the stomach acid, but they're not ready. I think at the end of the day, you're really kind of back to, um, you know, the you, you, your, best, your best guess. You know, did they come back and get a refill? Remember, you should only be getting one month supplies of these cases. So if they don't come back, it gives you an indication. And then, uh, you, know, um, you, know, you know, lastly, I do think there's a role maybe for other, in, you know, things to help, uh, which is like, you know, text messaging, video DOT, and they can be done, and I think we'll be seeing more of it. But I do want to remind everybody, even if you do DOT, you know, remember, you can't follow that person around. So even if they do DOT, it's, it's as good as you can do. There's a chance that after you leave, they're spitting it out. So I do want to say there's always going to be, an, you know, some issues with adherence, adherence. But you could try to help that. Dave, do you agree or disagree on Neela? Yeah, no, I oh, think I agree, it's Dave. a really good point. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, no, I was just saying I agree with Dave. I, uh, maybe I, video DOT I think is promised, but you know uh, patients can always defeat you. Is this a, is this being recorded, Neil? I just want to just keep that little sound bite right there where he says he agreed with me. Can we just can I get that? Please? 
Well, well, with that, what we're going to do, like I said, we're going to try and address some of these questions um, and send out to the group. There's really a lot of fantastic questions here that we just don't have time to answer. I want to um, close also by letting folks know that at the end of the presentation in your um, PDF slides, there are a couple slides about further LTBI resources. Um, some are through CDC here, and you can order those online and get some free hard copies. You can kind of peruse the websites. Some of the questions you all have raised are addressed there. There's also some nice resources through the Centers of Excellence. Um, but I just want to give a heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers today. And for all of you who joined, there's been over 500 participants coming in and out of the webinar. So we know there's a lot of interest. Please share what you've learned with your friends and continue the conversation. Um, and hopefully we will be talking with you again soon. Thank you so much.